selection process. If I can get you guys to move forward, please, so that when Gay gets ready to talk, she doesn't have to fight, compete. While you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and give you a little rundown on the description of the session. I'm Callie Basto with UDOT Consultant Services. And this is how the consultants get selected for design and engineering services contracts. We'll learn this and more about consulting selection process. This is Gay Hedrick. She is with UDOT Consultant Services. She is the Consultant Services Manager. She's been, she has been with the state for over 25 years in various roles and divisions. This is a CEU session you can get credits for, so please sign the roll, make sure that's taken care of, and I'll start that out. I'm going to turn the time over to Gabe. Thanks, Callie. So, um, this is the basic consultant selection processes. These are the items that give us the authority to contract through the state. Um, there's the Brooks Act, which is the, state, the, the, the uh, federal code, which is the qualifications-based selection process and requirements. Um, 23 CFR 172 is the procurement, management, and administration of engineering and design-related services. So this is the, the code of federal regulations that, it, that oversees our process. There's the Utah Code 72. It's the Transportation Code, Chapter 2, Transportation Finances Act. And that's what gives us um, authority to contract directly as opposed to going through state purchasing. There's the AASHTO Guide for Consultant Contracting and the Manual of Instructions that we have. So, the general basic contract request process. The UDOT project manager requests a contract in our EPM system. We have a module called the Contract Management System. And, it, and they select through one of our approved selection methods that we're going to go through today. The consultant then um, develops their contract documents in CMS, that's their scope, schedule, and budget. And then the project manager and consultant negotiate those items, come to an agreement. Um, the project manager then submits the items through our system in CMS to consultant services. And then consultant services takes those documents, incorporates them in the contract boilerplate, and routes them for signature and approval and issues a notice to proceed when that's complete. So we have two um, ways of selecting consultants. There's the pre-qualified lists of consultants that we develop, um, and then there's the requests for qualifications. So the first that we're going to go over is the pre-qualified list of consultants. We have four um, lists of consultants and contractors we've developed into pools. There's the General Engineering Services and Local Government Pool, which I'll call the GE Pool. We have the Right-of-Way Acquisition Services and Local Government Pool, the Structural Design and Management Support Services Pool, and the Bridge Collision and Emergency Repairs Pool, which is for contractors. Those last two we're not going to go over today, but we'll go over the first two. The first one we're going to go over is the General Engineering Services and Local Government Pool. This is the pool that we use the most. Um, we select the majority of our contracts out of this, this, this pre-qualified list. And um, we have a current pool period runs from July 1, 2013 through June 30, 2016. And so we will be developing the new pool that will start July 1, 2016 and run through June 30, 2019. And here's how we go about setting up that pool. We develop an RFQ, and we'll be doing that from now until when we post the RFQ, which is in February. Uh, it'll be February 16th. 
the estimated posting of the new RFQ. Consultants then prepare statements of qualifications in response to that RFQ and submit those statements by the time uh, of the deadline, which is April 5th, 2016 at 11 a.m. We um, process those statements of qualifications, organize them, and then um, send them out to our selection teams for evaluation. And they go through an evaluation process based on the criteria and um, submit those scores into consultant services. We then um, collect all those scores and administrate all of that, come up with the final scores for the consultants in each of those work disciplines and determine a threshold score where consultants, if they score a certain score or higher, then they're admitted into the pool for that work discipline. And if they don't reach that score, then they don't get in for that particular work discipline. So the posting of the school and the final the pool and the final determination will happen at the end of June and we'll be sending out debriefs to those consultants that have submitted. Any questions on that process? Yes, Marty. Are you going to change or do something different for the work disciplines? Are you anticipating that for this week? Um, probably. We haven't done the full development. As I said, we're starting now to develop that. Um, we'll look at lessons learned from the previous pool or the current pool period and look to see if we haven't used a particular work discipline or not. Um, if we've developed a need over time for a, a specific new work discipline, then we may, do, we may establish that as well. But you'll be able to see that in February and um, you'll submit a st separate statement of qualifications for each work discipline that you might be interested in. Any other questions on that? Okay, so for the current pool period, as I said, we're just still developing the new pool period. But for the current pool period, we have 27 different work disciplines that um, project managers can select from. And this pool is designed for small and simple projects. Consultants qualify every three years with two interim submittal deadlines and uh, requalification thrown in at midpoint. I'm going to put that on the list. Um, and then the consultant cumulative cap over the three years is 3.75 million for um, state work and 2.7 million for local government work. So that's the contract and any mods to the contracts that are selected using this method. So the approximate time to get a contract from PM request until notice to, pre or it, notice to proceed is four to five weeks. We have two levels of selection out of the pool. There's the direct select and the request for pool letter of qualifications or R plot process. So let's go over the direct select method first. So a PM simply selects a, a firm from the list that's been pre-qualified in our process and out of a specific work discipline. Sorry, my notes are... Um, <coughs> Over the past year, we've selected 326 and, and um, executed 326 contracts out of using this direct select method. So there are um, some caps and limits that we put on the direct select method because it is a considered as a small purchase or a, um, a less um, competitive process. So we've capped the the direct select method at 150,000 due to federal and state regulations. And then um, in order to make sure we don't go over that cap of 150,000, we set a threshold of 120,000 based on the independent cost estimate in order to be able to use this selection method. So that would allow $30,000 buffer for any mods or um, changes to the contract. And we also, um, tack on a 25% contingency on the pool dollars. So it'll be the contract amount plus any um, mods plus a contingency. The second level of um, selection through the pool is the request for pool letter of qualifications. It's still considered a GE pool selection and it um, must be on a pre-qualified list in order to be used to, to be selected for this method. We um, invite five consultants, or approximately five, 
to submit a pool letter of qualifications. And then um, the, our plot has a higher level of comp competition, so we go ahead and um, increase the caps, and we'll talk about that. So the basic process for um, an R plot selection is PM, or the U.PM, prepares a request for pool letter of qualifications form, which includes the project information and their goals, the scope of work, and a deadline for proposals to be submitted. The, the PM then forms a three-person or at least three-person selection team in order to um, process the selection or go through the process. The PM chooses five consultants from the pre-qualified list in the specific work discipline and invites them to submit a pool letter of qualifications. The consultants then prepare that pool letter of qualifications and submit it by the deadline that's in the R block. So what con is consisted in one of those proposals is a cover page, a two-page letter, a one-page project experience chart, and an appendix B. So um, three real pages of, of content and then a cover page and an appendix B. PM and then the selection team collect those proposals, they review them and score them, or I should say rank them, based on two criteria, project team and project approach. The consultant services then approves that selection, so the PM will send their, their, um, their selection, their uh, rankings into consultant services, and consultant services will make sure that they've done everything that they need to do to support that selection. And then um, the PM notifies the consultants of the results. The PM enters negotiations and contracts with the first ranked firm. Or if they can't come to an agreement, they discontinue negotiations and move on to the second ranked firm. And as is in the Brooks Act, you cannot go back to the first ranked firm. So if you can't come to an agreement with the second ranked firm, you move on to the third ranked firm. So the caps for an R plot selection, because it is still considered a, a pool selection, is $600,000 is the actual cap of the contract. And we use a threshold of a $450,000 based on the independent cost estimate as a, as a guideline to suggest a different level of selection if your independent cost estimate is um, that high or higher. <clears throat> this is considered a pool um, contract, so we do add the contract amount and the contingency to the cumulative cap of the 3.75 million or the 2.7 million. So um, this, this graph is just showing you the same thing we just covered. There will be the independent cost estimate. It tells you 0 to 120,000. You should be using direct select. 120,000 to 450,000. You should be using the R block. And um, if it's over 450000 then you should be doing a request for qualifications type process. Now, this isn't mandated. If for some reason there's a complexity or you anticipate the contract may exceed the, the cap of the 150000 for direct select, you'll want to move it up to the next level. Or the same thing for the R block cap of 600000 and occasionally we'll have a, a unique situation or scope that just doesn't fit in our work disciplines. And so we may go out for a higher level competition for that. Oh, and it just kind of shows you an estimate on how long those processes take. It takes about four weeks for a direct select from the request to NTP, and then six weeks for an R block, and up to three months for an RFQ. Now those are just estimates. So they can take a lot shorter or unfortunately sometimes longer. So that's kind of the pool process. So um, let's go over the RFQ process. Basically, um, this is real simplified, but you form a selection team of technical experts. You develop the RFQ and an independent cost estimate on how much you think the project will cost.
So if you're on UDOT's side, you need to make sure you've, you've estimated correctly or if you feel uncomfortable or, lip or, or more um, new to the process, you may want to lower those thresholds on your own behalf and say it's 100000 if you want to leave a little bit more buffer. Because that 150000 is a hard and fast cap. We will not allow you to go over that $150,000. Um, <clears throat> so, and if you're in a consultant, and you have been approached by a project manager or someone at, at UDOT on a direct select, and you know ballpark, there's no way that you can do this project for under 150,000. Before you get into the details, before you even go any further, you need to tell the project manager that. And the reason why you want to do that is because if you get this negotiated and you get it down and you've cut stuff down and you're at 149,000 and you've left no buffer, we're not going to let you go forward, and we're also going to call, say conflict you out of that selection process. The project manager will then have to go back, develop a scope of work, and send out an R block, but not invite you, even though you've invested all this time in this negotiation. So um, you need to be uh, thinking about that and help your project manager out and let them know that there isn't really a way to get this for, well, you should be using 120,000 actually, because things come up on the project that, that you may not have anticipated, or the project manager may not have been in, anticipated, um, that may push, so you need that buffer of the 30,000. So, anyway, questions on that? Dave's perfectly right for bringing that up, so. No? Okay. So let's go back to the RFQ. Um, so we advertise and post the RFQ after it's been developed, and we hold one-on-one -on -one communication meetings. That's a new thing. Um, the code changed in that we can no longer have folks at UDOT talking to consultants after the RFQ is posted or after the RPLOC is sent out, except through formal communication. So we've set up one-on-one -on -one sections uh, sessions um, during that process. <clears throat> Consultants then submit their proposals and selection teams evaluate the proposals and interview if need be or if the process demands. Consultants are ranked based on their qualifications and um, the contract is negotiated and executed with the first ranked firm or if we can't come to an agreement we discontinue negotiations and move on to the second ranked firm based on the Brooks Act. Yeah. Well, it's a new process, so what we've done with our plocks is we've said we're not going to hold one-on-ones after the invitation goes out. So what's kind of developed over time is the project manager will contact the firms they're going to invite and have a, a form, informal conversation with that firm, um, those five firms that are invited and then send out the notification. Then if a clarification comes up, you can still talk to consultant services anytime. You're not barred from talking to consultant services either in the RFQ process or in the RPLOC process. So if you have a clarification question come up, feel free to go ahead and contact consultant services, even if it's outside of those one-on-ones. Um, we will either um, find an answer for you or tell you it do it's not applicable for this particular procurement or, um, you know, if we get the answer for you, we'll need to send it out to all the firms that were invited as far as the RPLOC goes. If it's, to, if it's an RFQ, we may end up doing an addendum to the RFQ to clarify something. If something comes up after the one-on-ones. Or even maybe during the one-on-ones. Any more questions on those? There's um, <clears throat> approximately five different variations on the RFQ, RFP type selection and consultant services. We have the streamlined RFQ, the request for letter of interest, the standard RFQ, and the 
Public Involvement RFP and the Right of Way Acquisition Services RFP. So let's talk about the streamlined RFQ. The minimum advertisement time is two weeks and a statement of qualifications generally will con consist of a four-page statement of qualifications with a project team work chart and a project experience chart included in those four pages, a staffing plan, and there's no limit on that, call it an appendix B here at UDOT, um, no interviews unless there's a tie for first down to the hundredth decimal place. Now this may change, I don't know if you guys know, but the CFR, um, the, the Code of Federal Regulations has changed and um, we'll be implementing some changes to some of these processes due to those changes and those are uh, need to be in place by June of next year so you may see something change on that. <clears throat> the process duration is approximately two months from the request until the notice to proceed. Oh, and we've had, we've executed 17 contracts over the past year using the streamlined RFQ, not counting supplemental contracts. So, request for letter of interest. The minimum advertisement now is two weeks. That's part of that CFR change where we have to advertise for at least 14 days. Um, the letter of interest consists of a, of a cover page, a two-page letter, project experience chart and appendix B or um, a staffing plan. For the request for letter of interest process, interviews are, are required or mandatory. So we'll collect the proposals, um, shortlist based on those proposals, and then interview those firms that are shortlisted. That process takes approximately two months from request and notice to proceed. RLOI, we've had two contracts executed over the past year. The standard RFQ, yes? What makes you decide to use a streamline versus an LOI? Good question, and I'm, I've got a slide that might cover that a little bit later. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> so the standard RFQ minimum advertisement is three weeks. The statement of qualifications consists of a cover page, anywhere from, well, we could go as low as four, um, to 15 pages, that's just a ballpark um, statement of qualifications that includes the project team work chart, the project experience chart, and appendix B. And um, based on uh, those scores and the spreads is how we determine if there's an interview needed in this um, type of selection method. It's, um, it's somewhere between mandatory and only if tied for first. So we do a, um, based on a spread, point spread. Process takes anywhere from two to three months from request to notice to proceed. We've done nine contracts using that selection method over the past year. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison and um, kind of walks you through what the differences are um, so you've got the streamlined RFQ, the RLOI, and the standard RFQ, the approximate times it takes um, to get from request to notice to proceed, the minimum advertisement time, the differences in the proposals, um, the evaluation criteria, the standard ones that we use are project team, capability of consultant, and project approach. On the request for letter of interest, it's much more variable. We don't always use those same three. And for standard RFQ, we use those three, but sometimes we can vary that as well. Um, and then whether the interviews are required versus um, man, uh, only if we go to the tie for the first uh, ranked firms. So a lot of times it'll be the interview that'll make the decision between which process to use. Um, for example, you know, if you really want to meet the teams, you might go with a request for letter of interest so you can be sure to have interviews. Um, if it's an environmental document, you may want to go with a um, standard RFQ so you can see the proposal and you get a, a finished product in writing that you can review. But you can also have that opportunity to interview as well if need be. So that's kind of, you know, differences in the, in the, in the process kind of generate 
why you would select one one process over another. Does that answer your question? Okay. So let's talk about um, the two different selection methods, services I should say, that are a little bit different in that they're not strictly considered under the Brooks Act. One of them is public involvement services and the other is right-of-way acquisition services. So let's talk about public involvement. <coughs> the main differences um, uh, between the GE pool and, or excuse me, the engineering services type selection and the public involvement version. Well, the main one is it, it's um, got separate caps and, um, well, I should say, the main thing is that it's, it's not strictly considered qualifications-based selection for public involvement. Um, but the pool caps are different. We do have a different um, cumulative cap, and we also have a different <coughs> contract cap limit on those. And we do include cost as part of the criteria for our blocks and RFPs, but not for direct select. So the, the public involvement caps that we're using for this pool period until June 30, 2016 is a direct select contract cap of 40,000 with a threshold of 35,000. So if the independent cost estimate is 35,000 or less, then you can go ahead and use the direct select. Um, and then the RPLOC contract cap is 200,000 with a threshold of 160,000 to allow for potential mods. And the contract amount and contingency are added into the cumulative contract amount of 700,000 for state work and 700,000 for local government work. And then we have the PI RFP, which includes a sealed 20% um, cost criteria for blended hourly rate for RPLOCs and RFPs. So this is a different process we've used for the last few years. Um, we used to include public involvement just as a regular general engineering and have implemented the cost criteria over the past three years, but not for direct select. So here's another matrix showing you those um, differences. As you'll see, um, if the contract independent cost estimate is 0 to 35,000, then we recommend a direct select. Um, the on-call contract is also capped at 40,000. It takes approximately four weeks from request to notice to proceed. 35,000 to 160,000 with a $200,000 cap um, is for our plots. And then anything over 160,000, we do a full-fledged RFP. Now, what determines whether it's a public involvement? If, um, if the predominant element of the work is public involvement, then we consider it a public involvement contract. If we leave the public involvement in the regular engineering as a sub-work discipline under a regular engineering contract, we don't use this different selection method. We just go ahead and use the qualifications-based selection for that service. Any questions on PI? Let's talk a little bit about right-of-way acquisition services. And if you attended um, Callie's session um, a couple days ago, some of this is a little bit of a repeat, but that's okay, right? <laughs> um, differences between the engineering services selections and right-of-way acquisition. Pool caps are, actually it's a completely separate pool as we discussed earlier in the, in the presentation. But the pool caps are separate from the GE pool, but they kind of model the GE pool. Uh, the pool consultant cumulative caps are different though. And the cost criteria is included for our blocks and RFPs. That's what makes it different from the engineering services type of selections. So the pool caps, um, for a direct select right-of-way acquisition contract, it's 150,000, with the 120,000 as the threshold with contingency. And um, our plot contract cap is 600,000, with a threshold of 450,000. As you can see, this model is the GE pool. But where the difference is, is the cumulative cap over the three years is 1.5 million for state work 
and 1.5 million for local government work, which is quite significantly lower than the GE pool caps. And then we also have the right away RFP, which includes a sealed 20 to 30 percent cost criteria. We haven't actually done one of these yet, but we will be in the near future. RFPs, I mean. Um, or our, our plocks. So it's kind of a new thing that we're going to be adding to right away acquisition. So here's the, 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 the flow as I've had on the previous slides. That zero to 120,000 for a direct select, 120,000 to 450,000 for the right away R plocks. 450,000 and above for white right away RFPs. So the timelines are on there as well. So um, I'm just going to combine the public involvement and right away RFP type selections. Um, the minimum advertisement is three weeks. The technical proposal can be anywhere from four to 15 pages. And um, it's got a project team work chart, it's in the project experience chart, appendix B, sealed price proposal for 20 to 30 percent of the total um, points, and we'll have interviews if needed, and the process duration is two to three months. So here's my, my staff and me. Um, we've got Raylene Sanchez, who's, who does our RFQ contracts. We've got Mike Haney, who does our financial screening and contract administration. He does a Regions 3 and 4 right now. Kelly Basto, who's recently been um, moved over to right away acquisition contracts. She still does a few pool contracts in her spare time. Um, Tammy Anderson is a new employee, effective Monday, this past Monday, and she's in our audience here. She's going to be doing some financial screening to help out Mike, as well as some pool contracts, too. Mike Butler um, does our CMGC contracts as well as our local government contracts. He is a consultant with WCEC. And then there's Phil Ells Ellsworth who does our design build and some of our RFQs. He's a consultant with WCEC as well. Um, Devin Tonks, he does, he supports both Mike and Phil and does a lot of our overflow on pool contracts when we get a peak period. And we have Pepper Devonham, who does right-of-way acquisition services contracts and also helps with overflow. So, anybody have any questions? No? I have it in my notes. Hang on just a second. <laughs> Twenty-eight. I think that's both PI and um, GE. Any other questions? Our selection teams. For an R block, it's three or more. For um, work disciplines in the pool, it's three or more. For streamlined RFQ and smaller RFQs, it starts, it's, it's usually around five. And for larger RFQs, it's around seven. And that consists of a, a partially from our regions and partially from the complex. Um, we we want to have a good consistency between program and project. And um, the second part of your question was on the one-on-ones. Do all of the team members go to those? No. Generally, no. Usually, it's the project manager and consultant services. We may add one technical lead if need be. But generally speaking, not the whole team attends. And we may have people there that aren't on the selection team as well. But the new process says that you can't um, go shopping around and talk to UDOT folks trying to um, figure that out anymore. So, who's on the selection team? So, um, yes? How do you determine who's going to be on the selection team? 
she said, who, how do we determine who's on the selection team? We have a process for that where the project manager will propose a selection team, the contract administrator will submit that to myself and Lisa Wilson, who's the engineer for pre-construction, and like I said, the consistency is usually 50-50 or maybe a little bit more on the region side. Um, we review those and look and make sure that we've got that right consistency and um, Lisa and or myself will approve those selection teams. Um, we have to look to see whether there's a conflict as well. Um, that's become such a big topic these days. We do have each selection team member fill out a conflict of interest and confidentiality form. We do that at the beginning of the project before the scoping. And then we also have it do it, we revisit that issue when we receive the proposals to make sure we send out a list of who the prime and any subs are to the selection team to confirm that they don't have a conflict before we'll send out the proposals. So that's kind of a big part of the selection team. Um, I don't know that we've ever thrown the project manager off of a selection team, but um, that's not to say it won't happen in the future. So, any other questions? He asked what the differences are for local government contracts. It's pretty consistently the same. The caps are the same, other than the cumulative cap. Um, when we go through the pool process, we just duplicate. It's not like we have separate firms that do local government versus um, state work. The contract terms and conditions are certainly different because the contract is between the local and the consultant with UDOT acting in the federal role of oversight, and we administrate the contract as well. Um, as far as selection teams go, we do add at least one, if not two, local representatives on the teams. So is that, unless of course they have a conflict. We do direct select with local government, and, and what happens is a, is a conversation happens between the local government um, representative or project manager and the UDOT project manager. They walk through their options, and it's usually the local who will make that decision of who the consultant is with some input from, from the project manager of UDOT. Depending on the sophistication of how many times a local's been involved in this kind of process, um, the, the pendulum will shift um, based on their experience. Um, if you've got a local that has done a, a number of contracts, they'll do. They'll just basically make that selection on a direct select. But if it's someone who has little or no experience with the UDOT process or the firms, you may get the PM having playing a big the UDOT PM playing a bigger role. The local government pool list is a duplication, exactly the same as the, as the state one. So we don't even differentiate during the selection of getting on the pool. Um, it's and then we just duplicate it in the system once it's in place. So Mike, you had a, a question. Well, public involvement is not um, defined as an engineering related service and that's the difference between it and some of the other work disciplines and um, the Brooks Act specifically talks about engineering services or engineering related services and that's where the qualifications based selection comes from is the Brooks Act which is federal code um, so that's why I think we, we, we started with PI, just threw it in, because it's such a big element of environmental documents. And public involvement has grown over time. 
we're doing it on every, almost every project, or I should say we're doing it on every project to some level. And so as that grew, it became more of a focus on um, whether it should or should not be considered Books Act related. Um, and I believe there was a conversation down on the first floor. They decided that it was not strictly, I think it, they even um, went to the AG's office and talked amongst themselves and determined it's not considered engineering related and therefore cost should be a criteria. Now, we've sort of created a hybrid where cost is not always considered. On a direct select, we don't consider cost. Um, but on the higher level of competition, we do. And we, we, did, we did do the same thing for right-of-way services. It's not strictly Brooks Act related. So we're doing, we modeled it after essentially the PI process, although the caps are certainly higher. Um, so that's why we've included it there as well. And you think it's just going to be PI and, and right-of-way for now? For, for now, I haven't heard any rumblings about other, process, other um, work disciplines. Um, so, any other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you, and be sure your name's on the roll, and um, we'll see you later. Oh, and if you want my business card, I have some up here if you're interested. <laughs>